My name's Jamin. Uh, I would typically be leading worship, but as Sean said earlier, half our staff is in Romania, and so I get the privilege. I don't know how I get this privilege, but I get to preach the last message in our series in the book of John. It shouldn't be me, but this is what the Lord had for me and for us this morning, so I'm excited about that. Um, Saturday morning at 6 o'clock in the morning or so, I get a text message from Francois saying he was praying that we'd have a great day in Peoria, and they are 10 hours ahead of us, and I, I have, I've always had for a long, long time this, like, this nightmare of waking up too late on a Sunday morning and not being at church where I needed to be, and I saw this message from Francois, and I was like, wait, what day is it? I'm not ready to preach yet. It was Saturday, thank goodness. I was like, man, it's only Saturday. And he, he said, ha, 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 I know. It wasn't funny. Um, <laughs> no, they, had, they already worshiped today. Francois preached there. And uh, from everything that we have heard, our team in Romania is having some fruitful ministry already. Please continue to pray for them. This morning, as I said, we are going to be at the end of John. We're going to be in John 21, and we're going to be in verses 20. To 25 as we conclude this gospel. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open it up to there, and I'm going to meet you there in just a second. Growing is a really big deal when you're a kid, right? In my house, growing was a big deal. I'm the oldest of five sons, and uh, my parents in our pantry, they had a, a place where we would all stand up against the pantry door, and they would put a book, you know, on our head and mark where we were growing. And then, we'd, you know, they'd write the measurement down. They'd write our name and the date. And we were so enthusiastic about growing that sometimes we'd ask our parents to do it multiple times in the same week. And they're like, it doesn't work like that. Uh, but we wanted to grow. And I was the oldest, right? So I was always sort of the leader of the pack. You could see where I was and then where all my brothers were. And most of the time, you don't continue to be the tallest brother, but here I am, 43 years old, and unless proven otherwise, I'm still the tallest of my brothers. Now, being five foot eight in something is nothing to brag about, but it's true. So I, I was one of those kids that shot up really, really quickly. I've been this tall since I was about 14 and a half years old, and I played basketball. I played basketball all through elementary school, whenever we could on the playground. I played in junior high. And um, in eighth grade, I was the center of my basketball team, and I was dominant. I would, I would hit the glass. I was pulling down rebounds. I was blocking shots. I was awesome. And then in ninth grade, in ninth grade, I was a small forward. And in 10th grade, well, I played baseball in the spring. I just, I had the, the, the body of a point guard, but I had the skill set and the mindset of a power forward, and it just wasn't going to work out for me. Baseball was not for me. I didn't work on dribbling, for example. I, I, I couldn't dribble. I, I wasn't an outside shooter. Well, unlike physical growth, which has an end for all of us, we're all going to stop growing at some point, our spiritual growth, our discipleship should be, un, the growth should be unending. Every disciple of Jesus is going to grow. It's guaranteed. We, were all, we, we will all grow throughout our whole lives on this earth. In fact, that's our big idea this morning. Life in his name is a life of ever-growing discipleship. So let's, uh, let's go to the scripture. Let's go to John 21 and read that and see what the Lord has for us today. Verse 20 says this. Remember, uh, Jesus has just restored Peter and he said, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. And the last thing that Jesus says to Peter is, follow me. And then we read this. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. They're like walking down the beach here. The one who, was also, who also had leaned back against him during the, supper and, during the last supper and said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And so the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? 
This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose, that the world itself could not contain the books that be, would be written. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this word. I pray that your spirit would meet with us now, that our hearts would be prepared for what it is you have to say to us, and that we would obey. And Lord, by obeying, we would continue to grow as you have challenged us to do so in your word today. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Life in his name is a life of ever-growing discipleship. So how, how are we going to grow? We're going we're gonna to do it like this. There are three growth points for us that I believe are in this passage here. And so we'll, if you're taking notes, it's going to say up here, discipleship grows as I am more. And our first point is this, discipleship grows as I am more focused on a personal pursuit. Jesus had just presented himself to the disciples alive. He had just restored Peter. He gave uh, Peter a commission for new ministry. He was going to lead the church. He was going to care for the church. And Jesus punctuates his reinstatement of Peter with the words, follow me. And then in verse 20, man, Peter just misses it. <laughs> he turns and saw John, the disciple who Jesus loved, following, and he said, Lord, what about this guy? What's going to happen to him? And the Lord says, what's it to you? If it's my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Jesus said, follow me, and Peter's next words aren't, yes, Lord, I'll follow wherever you lead. Nope, just like when he was on the Sea of Galilee and Jesus is walking on the water and Peter walks on the water to meet the Lord, as soon as Peter takes his eyes off the Lord, he starts to sink. Well, the Lord again has said, follow me, and Peter is taking his eyes off the Lord, and now they're going over to John. If I'm gonna die a martyr, what's gonna happen to John? What's gonna happen to him? What about John? Now, Peter loves John for sure. These two men were friends. They had been together as disciples of Jesus for the last three years, and their ministry is connected for years beyond this. So in some way, there's definitely a concern for John in this question, but it's pretty clear by the way that the Lord answers the question that Peter was missing something. He was missing the point. He was shifting the focus away from himself and wanting to put it over to John. Jesus says to Peter, what's it to you? Mind your own business. If you're reading in the ESV or if you're reading in the NASV, you see that there's an exclamation point at the end of verse 22. He says, you follow me, exclamation point. That's not just editorial, okay? The, the translators are trying to convey that there was a very emphatic statement there from the Lord. There was a command and it was strong, all right? Just like in English, um, you, can, you can have a command and you don't need necessarily a subject, so you follow me. Like if, I, if my coach says, come here, he doesn't need to say, you come here, he's talking to me. However, if the coach says, you come here, I'm not so excited to go over to where coach is. I probably haven't done something right, right? I'm about to get yelled at. And the, the same is in, in the Greek, Jesus is saying, you follow me. If it's my will for him to remain, what's that to you? The Lord wants Peter's eyes on him, and he wants them on him right now, and he doesn't want that focus to ever waver again. What about John? Parents, does this moment feel familiar to you at all? I hear some snickers. Maybe you've, you know, just had a patient, firm, and loving conversation with one of your children, or say about, I don't know, the condition of the kitchen or the condition of their bedroom. I'm speaking hypothetically, of course. And you say, firmly but lovingly, I need you to take care of this mess. And what's the next word out of their, your child's mouth? Well, what about, none of my kids are in here, what about Piper? All right, what about Aubrey? That's the, all, all of us do this. My kids do this. I'm sure your kids do this. We want to shift the focus away from ourselves and put it onto someone else. 
We do this in our own discipleship. We do this in our own walk. We, we want to worry about everybody else that is around us, but our, our discipleship grows when our pursuit of Jesus is focused. It's a personal pursuit. I can't do it for you, and you can't do it for me. Not to say that we don't need one another. Of course we need one another. We need one another to encourage each other. But if I'm wrapped up in what's going on with you, or you me, then we're taking our eyes off where they need to, need to be, which is on Jesus. We look at our situation and we, we compare it to others. We look at our gifts, our roles, and we become discontent. We become discouraged. Oh, sure, this person over there is following Jesus, but look at how easy their life is. I'm suffering. I don't have anyone caring for me. I don't have anyone providing for me. I'm being overlooked. I mean, of course I would follow Jesus if I had a husband who was caring for me, who was providing for me, if who was praying for me every night. I would follow Jesus. And the Lord is saying to you, what is that to you? You follow me. Maybe you're a busy dad and you're saying, Jamin, I, I work so many hours and when I get home, we have kids. The, the, the list of things that I have to do around my house is unending. Come on, I mean, Pastor Seth gets paid to read his Bible. He gets paid to make disciples. He is freed up to do all kinds of things. If I had a life like him, then of course I would be following Jesus. The Lord says to you, what is that to you? You follow me. Maybe you're, maybe you're not a Christian yet. Maybe you want to follow him, but you don't think that you can. Your life is a mess. You look at yourself and your sin problems, and then you show up at a place like here, at Christ Church, and everybody seems to love each other, and people are carrying Bibles, and they're along in the wings praying for one another. They're singing songs to the Lord together, and you have no context for that. You're looking at yourself and saying, I, I'm not like this. I've got nothing to offer here. You want it, but you just don't think it's for you. This is what the Lord says to you this morning. He says, don't worry about that. What's that to you? You, you are invited to follow me. And believer, maybe, maybe your walk has cooled, right? Maybe, maybe your love for Jesus is growing stale, and you come to church when we're having a baptism service and, and you hear the testimonies about how God has rescued people from addiction, how God has rescued people from near suicide, and you think to yourself, oh, if I had just had a time in my life where I just let my sin be unbridled and God would have rescued me from that, then of course I would be following Jesus right now. But the Lord said, I made you mine early. I was gracious to you that you didn't have to experience that. Don't compare yourself to them. What is that to you? You follow me. You follow me. Believers, stop making comparisons. Comparisons are the thief of the joy that you have in Christ. The Lord had a very specific role for Peter to play. He chose Peter he died for Peter, was raised for Peter, and he equipped Peter with specific gifts that were gonna allow for him to fulfill the commission that God gave him. And the same is true for you and the same is true for me. He's done that for everyone who believes. I was chosen, you were chosen. We were saved at tremendous cost. And the Lord is saying to all of us this morning, you follow me, you follow me. How does our discipleship grow? It grows when we have a focused pursuit, a personal pursuit of our Lord and Savior. This makes me think of Luke 10 with, with Mary and Martha. You guys remember this? Martha, Jesus is at their house and Martha is flying around the house like this anxious hurricane of hospitality and Mary is just sitting at Jesus' feet and you can see the glances between the sisters, like Martha's so annoyed. And she says, Jesus, tell her to help me. I'm the only one doing any work around here. She's just sitting at your feet. You guys remember what the Lord says? The Lord says that Martha, Martha, <laughs> at, at VintageCon, Adam Bailey preached about this, and he said it this way. 
as if he's trying to get Martha's attention. Martha, Martha! He's trying to get her to, to look at him, which I, I love that. You are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. One thing is necessary. Personal pursuit, a focused personal pursuit. That is what leads to our growth. Jesus says to us, follow me. And so, okay, you're saying, fine, Jamin, how? You might be frustrated by my answer because it is simple. Pursue Jesus. Spend time with him. He knows you. He loves you. He sees you. He gave you a book that reveals his heart toward you. Talk to him. You can pursue the Lord in prayer at any moment of every day. Be here. If you're here this morning, you're doing it. You pursue Jesus personally by gathering with his people corporately. As I said before, we need one another on this pursuit. We all fall down. We all lose our way. It's hard to follow if you fall down. You need brothers and sisters who are gonna help pick you back up and help you catch up. Don't compare yourself to them, but be thankful, be humble, because they're following the Lord and they're doing that, what they're designed to do, which is to help pick you up. In God's wisdom, the scope and the scale and the speed of our individual growth is gonna be unique to whatever the Spirit is doing in each of us. But life in his name is still a life of ever-growing discipleship, no matter who you are. Follow me, he says. Before we get to our second point, I want to just share kind of an early church fun fact with you. If you look at verse 23, John says, So the saying spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Apparently someone, and most likely Peter, <laughs> unintentionally started a rumor that John would not die before the Lord returned. And this had spread through at least part of the church. So can you imagine if John was part of this church and he's starting to look older and he's starting to look older and you believe that he's immortal? But man, he sure doesn't seem like it. You know, like, have you seen John? He's not looking so good. And then you start making financial decisions based on John's declining health because you believe that Jesus is about to return. And I don't know if that was going on, but that was what, what John was trying to, to stop, is to say, listen, this is, the Lord never said this. If I pass away, you haven't missed anything. He's still coming again. It has nothing to do with whether or not I'm alive or dead. And so you just see him, even as he's finishing the gospel, shepherding the church and, and taking care of them, encouraging them, because there was some bad thinking out there. But moving on, discipleship grows as I am more focused on a personal pursuit. And number two, as I am founded on a true testimony. Verse 24, this is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things. And he's saying, I'm the one that Jesus didn't say won't die. This is the disciple who's bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. John is wrapping things up. He tells us that he's the eyewitness. He's the one who has the authority to write, write about these things, and not just what we're reading in chapter 21, but the entire gospel. He is the witness, and then he underscores the truthfulness of his testimony by including himself with the apostles. He uses this word, we. We know that his testimony is true. John is such a humble author, he doesn't even want to give his name. He doesn't want to rely solely on his own credibility. And so he stands a step back and he, he includes himself with all of the apostles and he says, we testify that these things are true. He did the same thing in John chapter uh, 1 verse 14, he wrote, we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. 
the early church knew the, the apostles. They understood the apostolic authority. And so John just steps back with all of them to bring more weight to the, the veracity of this, this gospel. And most of those men had been martyred by this point. John, John's alive. He might be the last living apostle at this time, but he still wanted to include them in the, the statement, we know that his testimony is true. In a lot of ways, this, this verse here is very similar to what I got to preach a couple of weeks ago, where we talked about how it was a sufficient record. Well, this is a true testimony. He's, he's saying it again. How does our discipleship ever growing? It's because we're founded on the word. Without the word, there is no discipleship. Without the word, we've got nothing to go on. The testimony is true, and this book is significant. It's the most significant book that has ever been written. It's not close. We need to be founded on a true testimony, or we can't grow. No wonder God has taken great pains, even within his word, to tell us how important the word is for us. I picked out just a few of these verses for you. I'm gonna put the references up here on the screen if you wanna write them down, if you wanna take a picture. His word is eternal truth. Psalm 119, 160. The sum of your word is truth and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Isaiah 40, verse eight. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. God's word sustains us and guides us. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. God's word helps us fight sin. Psalm 119, 11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Every word of God proves true. Proverbs 30, verse five, he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. 2 Timothy 3, 3, 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Our discipleship grows when it is founded on a true testimony. There is a particular plant that grows in the coastal deserts of Namibia and Angola, which is in West Africa. And this plant is called Welwichia. And why am I telling you about this? This plant is really, really cool. It never stops growing throughout its entire life. Is it up there? It's not much to look at. But it never stops growing its entire life, and it seemingly does not die. There are Welwichia plants in Namibia that have been dated to be over 3,000 years old. And it's growing in a desert. We, we all live in Arizona. If you've got a backyard or a garden where you're trying to grow things, you know how meticulous you have to be with the watering and even what time of day you water so that the sun doesn't you know, make all the water evaporate. Well, what sustains the Welwichia plant is its root system. The roots of the Welwichia can go down over 100 feet into the ground. This, this plant lives because it is rooted where its life source is. And in this case for the plant, it's water. But for believers, the parallel is, is easy, right? We need to be founded where our life source is. And that life source is in the word of God. We need to be founded upon it. John writes that these things were written so that we would have what? We would have life, life in his name. That life is eternal and ever growing. So read it. Read it, okay? Read it when you are alone. Read it with your spouse. Read it with friends. Read it to your children. Read it if it's, even if it's been 
days or weeks or months or even years since you've read it, pick it up again and read it. It is for you. It is for your growth. It is living and active, Hebrews 4.12 says. I can tell you truthfully, personally, that I am never having more victory over sin and I am never growing more than when I am rooted and founded in the word. And I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room that would say that. We've got a Bible reading program that we're doing as a church. It started in January. And maybe you started and then you missed a few days and you're like, well, that's that. That's, come on back. Maybe you didn't start and you wanna start now. You can. It doesn't matter that you missed the earlier reading. Come in and read this with us. It's such a blessing to be able to talk to somebody that we haven't, I haven't talk, seen in a couple weeks and we're reading the same thing together in the Bible and we're talking to one another about what God is doing because of this reading that we're doing. Read the book. Be founded in it. Because our discipleship grows the more I am founded on this true testimony. And lastly, our discipleship grows when I am more fixated on a great glory. Let's look at verse 25. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. John walked with Jesus for the three years of his earthly ministry. He heard the sermons. He saw all the miracles. He had the privilege of seeing Jesus transfigured with Peter and John. Jesus washed John's feet. John was there to witness the betrayal of Jesus. He was there to witness Jesus being crucified and he got to see the risen Lord. And so John ends his gospel just with worship. I mean, there's a little bit of hyperbole here if he's only talking about Jesus' earthly ministry, but I think that he's referring to much more than that. His gospel alone covers more than that. And so he takes a step back, he puts the pen down, and he just marvels for a minute. John understood the deity of Christ. He understood that Jesus was the Alpha and the Omega, that as he writes in John 1.1, 1, 1, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John understood what was accomplished at the cross and at the empty tomb. He understood, and he was so moved by it that he gave us this gospel. And depending on when he wrote it, John has also seen Jesus in his full glory that you read about in Revelation chapter one. He was motivated by this glory. Everything he did was informed by it. Peter was fixated on it. He died a martyr, no doubt, with that glory in his mind. He didn't want to be crucified like Jesus because he was so fixated on Jesus' glory. All of the apostles were killed violently for their faith. Why does that happen? Because they're fixated on a great glory. Their eyes were on Jesus. The apostle Paul, for the sake of the gospel, endured several lifetimes worth of hardship and suffering. And what does he say? 2 Corinthians 4, we don't lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light, momentary affliction. And if you know about the story of Paul, that's quite a statement. This, might, this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are are eternal. Jesus is glorious. Fixate on this great glory. It makes me think of the thief on the cross. You know, fixating is like letting it hit you, taking it in. I love the thief on the cross because his growth was rapid. He went from mocking Jesus 
to recognizing his own sin, to seeing Jesus who he, for who he was, to saving faith, and that happened fast, right? All he could do was fixate on the glory of Jesus. He was literally nailed to a cross. He deserved the punishment that he was receiving. And even in the midst of the earthly consequences of his sin, he fixates on Jesus and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Fixating on this great glory means put the news away, right? Jesus is sovereign over the world. He's sovereign over our country. He's sovereign over the president and all the things that come along with that. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't lose heart. Fixate and fix your eyes on Jesus. He is our glorious hope. Fixating on this glory means that you can rest. You can rest in Jesus' finished work. You don't need to earn God's approval. You already have it. So enjoy that. Rest in it. Fixate on that. I'm going to go to Paul again in Colossians chapter 3. Verses 1 through 4, he says, Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are, on, that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Many other things Jesus did. Because Jesus has never not been doing things. He's been doing things since the found, before the foundation of the world. And I'm very thankful that he's still doing things because if he wasn't, I wouldn't be standing here before you right now. I think we could all say the same. Jesus continues doing things and he will for all eternity. Life in his name is a life of ever-growing discipleship and our discipleship grows as we are focused on a personal pursuit, as we are founded on a true testimony, and as we are fixated on a great glory. Now, preaching at Christ Church is not just a lecture, okay? This is, this is truth that should be impacting our lives as we walk out of here this morning. And so before we go, I've got three questions for you. First question is, do I believe? Do you believe? John gave us this gospel so that you would believe. He has presented us with a sufficient record and a true testimony. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Do you believe? Have you trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and the blessing of eternal life? Is the Lord saying to you maybe for the first time, you follow me. Don't resist this call. Trust him today. And if you are a believer, if you claim Christ, let me ask you this question. Am I growing? Are you growing? I'm not talking about fake growth. I'm not talking about the kind of growth that you can show whenever you need to when you're around the right people, when you come to church or when you come to small group. I'm not asking if you're being a good Christian by checking boxes and showing up when you're expected to show up. I'm not asking you whether or not you pray at meals. It is possible to be familiar with Jesus and to be completely unaffected by him. Are you growing? Someone who is focused on a personal pursuit and founded in a true testimony and fixated on a great glory, those people are easy to see. And I'm not asking you this. I'm not asking you, are you struggling with sin or not? We all struggle with sin. In fact, we're gonna struggle with sin our entire lives. And one of the things that separates believing people from unbelieving people is the fact that they are struggling with sin. But growth leads to experiencing Jesus' victory over sin in every day of our lives. So are you growing? And my last question for you is this. 
Will you go? Will I go? Where is the Lord calling you? Peter had a role to play. John had a role to play. I do, you do. Remember, we were chosen. Jesus died for us. He was raised for us. And he has given us gifts that are there to help us fulfill his mission. So maybe you're stuck right now like Peter. You're you're looking at other people. You're shifting the focus off yourself and looking to others. Jesus is saying to you lovingly, graciously, and firmly, don't worry about them. You follow me. Will you follow? I hope you will. This is the last message in John. It has been a blessing to me. I can't believe it. We've been in this book for two and a half years. I think I said before, this is the 76th sermon that we have preached at Christ Church out of John's gospel. And it has been impactful in my life and the life of my wife. I know it's been impactful in the lives of many of you. And so as we finish this morning, I want to stand and I want to sing the song, Abide. This was a song that we chose because of how applicable it was to the the gospel of John. So we're going to sing this. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the well that never runs dry. All these themes from our passage this morning are in this song. So let me invite you to stand and let's sing this at the top of our lungs as we worship our King.